Folks, could I uh, invite you to, to go ahead and take a Bible from the, the pew or turn to your uh, device and we'll look at our, our passage that we're preaching on this morning, Luke chapter 12, and we're reading verses 13 to 21. If you're using the church Bible, it's on page 1044. We'll read from it and then keep it open because we're going to be uh, looking at it together. Um, Luke chapter 12, and we're reading from verse 13. Someone in the crowd said to him, Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, Watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And he told him this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you've plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, And be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich toward God. Amen. Let me pray. Holy Spirit, we ask you to come and open our eyes to see what we are incapable of seeing without you. Open our ears that we might hear what we cannot ourselves. And Lord, open our hearts that we might be led by you into a different way of living and thinking that makes us rich towards you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, Warren Buffett, uh, if you've ever heard of this gentleman, Warren Buffett, he's the chairman and CEO of Berkshire Hathaway. That's an umbrella company that owns dozens of American companies, including the insurance company Geico, Duracell, and Dairy Queen. He's considered uh, to be the most successful investor of all time. He bought his first stock at age 11. He filed his first tax return at 13 He has a personal net worth today of over $120 billion. And when he was asked about the wisdom of good decision-making around investing, he famously replied, well, it's good to learn from your mistakes, but it's even better to learn from other people's mistakes. Eleanor Roosevelt said something similar. She said, we don't live long enough to make every mistake ourselves, so we need to learn from the mistakes of others. So it's always nice, isn't it, to have someone to point to who's done something stupid and serves as a marker for us to avoid. It's interesting to me that one of the methods that Jesus used to teach was parables, stories, and and some of these uh, stories contained men and women who acted in foolish ways, who suffered the consequences of their folly so that we could read and hear and hopefully learn from their mistakes and avoid making them ourselves, mistakes or the foolishness of other people for us to avoid. And and for example, last week uh, in the service, Chloe told us the parable of two men who were building houses and we received the warning uh, not to be like the foolish man who, who built a house on sandy or weak or unstable foundations. But we should be like the wise man and build our lives upon the solid foundation of Christ. This week, I want to continue on the theme of parables. I want to consider the the stories and consider the examples of mistakes and foolishness that Jesus shows us and asks us to avoid. So if you have your Bible open, turn again to to Luke chapter 12, and we'll have a look at this uh, parable. Most translations Uh, entitled this parable, 
the parable of the rich fool. The rich fool. And it's interesting that the parable is actually told in response to a question that Jesus has asked. It's actually more than a question. It's an interruption. Uh, In chapter 12, Jesus is teaching a crowd about the spiritual danger of hypocrisy. Jesus is warning the crowd about the spiritual dangers of, 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 of saying one thing and doing another, of being one type of person in, in one crowd and being another person in another crowd, and how Christians should have the courage not to hide our commitment to Jesus or fear what others will say about our faith. And, and someone actually somewhat rudely interrupts this, this teaching and asks him to sort out a financial dispute between him him and his brother regarding an inheritance. It's interesting that some people just don't want to hear what Jesus has to say about about our hearts. Uh, And this man, he he puts his hand up and he says, Jesus, never mind all this spiritual stuff. Would you tell my brother uh, that he needs to divide our father's inheritance with me? That's the context of this this parable. And I know this guy isn't part of the parable, but here's the first thing we might want to avoid. Let's not assume that Jesus is here to sort out all our wants without caring about what he has to say to our hearts. This parable is an abrupt change of topic from the spiritual to the material. And so Jesus says to the crowd as well as to this man, he says, watch out, be on your guard against all types of greed because life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And then he tells the parable of the rich fool. And here's how it starts. He says, the ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant uh, harvest And he thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. So we're introduced to to a man. He's either a farmer or he owns land. His ground produces a crop so abundant that he doesn't know what he's going to do with it all. You'll notice he's already rich. He's described as a rich man. And he becomes so unexpectedly richer it causes him a problem. He's nowhere to put it all. His barns simply aren't big enough to hold his newfound wealth. There's a story about a 33-year-old uh, coffin maker in, in Sumatra in Indonesia. His name is Joshua. And uh, a meteorite crashed through the roof of his house. It weighed two kilograms. It literally crashed into his house He realized it was valuable, and he sold it for an undisclosed sum thought to be around a million pounds. Literally a gift from above that made him rich overnight. Now, have a think about about how that might happen in in, in our lives. Maybe it's a a price run on a a, a stock that you hold in your portfolio. Maybe it's an offer from a, a competitor to buy out your business or a solicitor's letter uh, the details an unexpected inheritance. But, but what we're seeing here is, a, is an unexpected, almost an overnight abundant increase of wealth that we didn't see coming. How are we going to react to that? Well, in the parable, we notice two things that this man didn't do. Two things that don't enter into this man's thinking. The first thing is he doesn't show any gratitude. The ground yielded an, an abundant harvest, and we see no acknowledgement of God who sends the rain to water the crops or the sun to make them grow. The, the, the wealth from the natural effects of this land does not produce anything like praise or, or, or thanks. Uh, there's no notion of an offering or, or, or a tithe of the first fruits of a, of a harvest. There's no gratitude in this parable and no acknowledgement of blessings that have been outside of this man's control. So, so, so before a- a- anyone says something like, well, everything that I have, I've worked for, I, I, I've, I've achieved my success with my own two hands, we, we might want to consider who gave us the intellect to study, who, who gave us agility and dexterity in, a, in our bodies, who has given us sustained health, 
and long years to be successful. There's no gratitude in this parable. And, and when we lack gratitude, we very rarely feel that we have enough. So it might be an exercise for us to stop here and think, uh, what do we have today that once we only hoped for? What do we have today that once we were praying for? And do we still possess an attitude of gratitude for, the, for those things? We don't see gratitude in, in this parable. And the second thing we don't see is, is, is any thought beyond himself. The man doesn't say, do you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to fill my barns right to the rafters. I'm going to fill every available space that I have and anything that's left over, anything that I can't possibly fit in, uh, I'm, I'll give it to the hungry. I'll, I'll give it to those who have nothing to eat. He, do, he doesn't say that. He doesn't say, Lord, thank you for such a bountiful harvest. Could you maybe direct me to someone whom I could bless, just as I have been blessed? It's always a good question for us to ask if God blesses us financially before I raise my standard of living, have I raised my standard of giving? It's not insignificant that Warren Buffett, worth $120 billion, has pledged to give away 99% of his fortune. Now, he still gets to keep a billion dollars, but he's given away 99% of his fortune. He founded the Giving Pledge, where billionaires can pledge to give away at least half of their Fortunes. It's interesting, the guy who, 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 who had a meteorite come through the roof of his house and sold it for a million pounds, he says, now I can retire and build a church in my community. We don't see that heart in this man. Uh, the, the, the Romans ha had a saying that money is like salt water. The more of it you drink, the thirstier you get. And we read from Ecclesiastes earlier on, whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income, the, the, the preacher says. And, and, and this man now, he has so much, he's nowhere to put it. It doesn't cause him to think generously. It causes him to worry about how am I going to be able to keep all of this for myself? He says, do you know what I'll do? I'll tear down my barns and I'll build, build bigger barns so I can store my surplus grain. Let me ask us from this parable, as God has blessed many of us financially, have we been grateful? And have we been concerned with raising our standard of giving before we raise our standard of living? God doesn't call this man a rich ingrate. God doesn't call this man a selfish, rich egoist, as repugnant as those characteristics are. God calls this man something else. God calls this man a fool. Why is this man a fool? Well, remember the warning that preceded the parable, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. In this parable, we get to see the inner monologue of this man. This is what he says. He says, I'm going to store all my grain in bigger barns. And then I'm going to say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. I actually like the King James Version of this a little bit better. It says, I will say to my soul, soul, Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. In his heart, this man has achieved the very pinnacle of life. There's nothing but luxury and opulence and lazy days. It's all Cuban cigars and 50-year-old scotch and first-class seats. Remember when someone asked George Best where all his money went? He says, I spent a lot of money on booze, birds, and fast cars, and the rest I squandered. 
Well, that's what this guy is saying to his own soul. But the folly of this man is not that this will ultimately turn out to be deeply unsatisfying. The folly of this man lands like a bomb in verse 20. God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Don't know what age this man is or supposed to be. He's young enough to to take on a building project, to build bigger barns. He's young enough to expect many years of, of, of easy living. So his own death was probably very far from his mind. But that very night was indeed the night of his death. His death came in the parable as suddenly and unexpectedly as his riches. The the Stoic philosopher Seneca wrote, he says, you are living as if you are destined to live forever. Your own frailty never even occurs to you. You act like mortals in everything you fear, but like immortals in everything you desire. We desire things. We hoard things as if we're never going to die. It's not a question of if, but when our own lives are demanded from us. And everything we own stays behind. No pockets in a shroud, the old proverb says, or we read from Ecclesiastes, everyone comes naked from their mother's womb, and as everyone comes, so they depart. They take nothing with them of their toil. They carry nothing in their hands. And in verse 20, Jesus sums up the foolishness that he wants us to avoid. It's not that the man stored up riches. This isn't a parable against success or being rich. It's not that the wealth is now divided up between relatives who probably didn't like him all that much. It's that he stored up riches for himself, but was not rich toward God. His foolishness was that he completely lived for this life, and he neglected the life to come. The psalmist says in verse 14, it's the fool that says in their heart, there is no God. That's how this man lived, as if there was no God. Not only did he not thank God, not only did he not ask God for direction and what he should do, his ultimate foolishness was that he did not prepare his own soul to meet God when he died. He was wealthy, according to the world. But he was poor when it came to God. And Jesus says to us, could we learn from this man's foolishness? Could we not make this man's mistake with all our efforts to be rich and successful and comfortable in this world, which is is okay, but could we see also the imperative to be rich towards God. There's a story about a a young person being asked about about the plans for their life. You've probably heard this. Well, I'm going to study hard and I'm going to get the best AQE result. And then what? Well, then I'm going to have the pick of grammar schools and I'll I'll probably go to to BRA or, 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 or INST. Well, then what? Well, then I'll probably go to Oxford and study law. Well, then what? Well, then I'll probably become a a, a very successful barrister in London. Yeah, and then what? Well, hopefully I'll I'll marry a beautiful woman and, and, and have three healthy children. Then what? Well, then I suppose I'll, I'll continue to work very hard and, and make partner of the firm and become very rich. Yeah, then what? Well, well then I'll, I'll probably retire early and I'll buy a house in, in the south of France with a vineyard and, uh, and drink my own wine. Then what? 
well, I guess I'll spend my days there and, and die there. Then what? What about after you die? You see, the Apostle Paul wrote to the, the churches in Corinth, and he said, he said if, if the dead are not raised, then let's eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. That was the attitude of the man in the parable. We live in a society with that mantra very much ingrained in our psyche. YOLO, you only live once. This is all there is. Let's make it count. Friends, Jesus tells us that the dead are raised. We're raised into the presence of a holy God to whom we give account. And can I ask you from this parable, in all your planning and efforts for this life, have you given any thought to your life after death? Will you be rich towards God or will you be poor? So by all means, let's work hard. Let's be successful. Let's retire well. Let's accumulate wealth. Let's enjoy it and be generous with it. This is not a parable against those things by any means. Let's do that, but let's not forget the question that Jesus asks. What would it profit us, if we gained the whole world but forfeited our souls, what are our souls worth? If you're wondering, how can I be rich towards God, make sure you're here next week because we're going to look at another parable that teaches us that very thing and the mistakes that we can make towards that. But for now, let me pray. Only one life. Yes, only one. Soon will its fleeting hours be done. Then in that day, my Lord, to meet and stand before his judgment seat. Only one life will soon be past. Only what's done for Christ will last.